language. You know, you have the alphabet and a blank, and you have all possible strings of one character in size is a finite list, then all possible strings two characters in length is a, is a finite list, and three characters in length four, five, six, uh, and um, since you allow blank, you can get uh, texts. So the set of all texts in any language is a countable or denumerable infinity. You can write it in a list, one, two, three, four, five. And um, s select all the ones which ask questions, questions which have yes, no answers. So you can imagine a list of every possible yes, no answer. It's going to be an infinite list, e yes, no question. It's going to be an infinite list. And Borel says, well, there is a real number that starts off with zero, and then there's a decimal point, and then each digit, or each bit, if you do it in binary, gives you precisely the answer to one question on this list of all possible yes-no questions. So you can have zero mean the answer is no, and one means the answer is uh, yes, for example. Uh, so, so you can put an infinite amount of information in a real number, and you simply have the nth digit of this real number tell you the answer to the nth possible question in a list of all possible yes-no questions. You fix the language. He used French. Uh, and um, this can be done a little more carefully. Uh, so the idea is this real number answers all possible yes-no questions. It has all knowledge, all knowledge that can be answered uh, yes or no in one real number. So if you knew this number, you would know the answer to every possible yes-no question. So Borel says, well, <laughs> should I believe in this number? And his answer is no. This number is really a reductio ad absurdum of the notion of a number. You see? He says, this is a fantasy. This is an unreal real number. So in actually, Borel, in a way, was anticipating uh, leading up to, I don't think Turing knew about Borel's work in 1936, but in 1927, this number of Borel's is in fact uncomputable. So this was a sort of a, a anticipation in a way. Borel was a constructive mathematician. He believed that if you prove that something exists, there should be a method to calculate the answer. So he was moving in the direction of, of Turing. This number in a way is a, uh, shows that, that, uh, that uh, c there are uncomputable reals, we would say now. I mean, uh, it's, 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 I would view this as a partial anticipation of Turing's 1936 uh, paper. So then, um, so, here's a, so the, why is this real number unreal? Well, because it has an infinite amount of information. I mean, the Encyclopedia Britannica, you can put in there very easily in the bits of a, of a real number with only a finite number of bits or a finite number of digits because the Encyclopedia Britannica is big, but it's finite amount of information. You know, so you just put every bit. You take the Encyclopedia Britannica, you m represent it digitally, which it is, you know, in com computer, and you just put it bit by bit here. And, and, and you know, if you had uh, two sticks, one is unit length by definition and the other is... Uh, the, 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 its length is the, this uh, Encyclopedia Britannica number, just being given these two sticks, you'd have the Encyclopedia Britannica. But what Borel points out is, in fact, you could put an infinite amount of information, not just a large amount of information, an infinite amount of information in a real number. So he doesn't believe that that makes any sense. Now, in 1956, uh, when Borel was in his 80s already, at the end of a long distinguished career, Borel's final book, is called uh, Le Nombre Inaccessible, The Inaccessible Numbers. And his final message to the world is on these questions, and Borel says it even more dramatically. He says the following, um, what if I just, w how many real numbers can actually be pointed to have an individual existence? you know, that I can somehow specify them, maybe non-constructively, you know, not via a computer program, but just being able to name a real number or, or have a, a, a way to refer to a real number as an individual real number. Well, the answer is that would be called an accessible real. If there's some way to, to pick it out from all the rest of the reals and at least give it a name, you know, refer to it. It may be a mathematical way of referring to it, which doesn't enable me to calculate the number, but at least I should have one way to... To, to, to pick it out or, and name it individually. 
So how many possible names are there or ways of referring to real numbers? Well, if you use a French text, it's only a countable infinity of possibilities. So as we saw before, the, all the, not just the computable reals have probability zero, but all the nameable real numbers have probability zero. Most real numbers will never be even nameable, you see, in any mathematical way, in any way at all. So they are completely inaccessible because language is only a countable infinity of possibilities. And the real numbers are a higher order infinity, you see. So, so, so this is, I'm trying to argue that, that real numbers don't exist, you see, even with, the, there are problems with real numbers even in the world of, of, of of, of, pure, of, of pure mathematics. So I'm going to get back to this subject. Oh, I'm using too much time. Let me, okay, I'd like to say what's happened since 1936, and I'm going to divide my uh, re remaining remarks into two, two subjects. One will be um, um, epistemology, and the other will be ontology. So the ontological part I've already began because I'm saying that real numbers don't exist. Um, now, the ontological part, you know, there are, uh, there are people in ancient Greece who said that the world was fire or the world was water. You know, in, people are water, right? Their blood plasm is like being in the sea. Uh, and there were, uh, Pythagoras said, everything is number. You know, that was his ontology. Everything is positive integers. Well, the new ontology that goes with digital philosophy and physics is it's, uh, the old ontology was of Pythagoras was uh, everything is number, God is a mathematician. The new ontology is everything is software, God is a computer programmer. Another way to put it is you're looking at the world as a giant computation or a giant computer. What is this computation computing? It's computing the next state of the universe from its current state. The time evolution of the universe is what this computation is. And as Tom Toffoli, one of these fellow travelers in this school says, or maybe it was Seth Lloyd, any computation, any, what a computer does is hitch a ride, a real computer like this, hitches a ride on this giant computer, which is the universe computing its, its future state from its current state. So, so, this, so this ontology in extreme forms, and I you know, like to be extreme, would say that everything is zeros and ones, and the universe is built out of discrete digital information. Um, now, I'll talk more about this because I want to talk about, you know, what connections there are with physics. I want to make some remarks about to what extent physicists might find this uh, uh, an acceptable ontology or not. But first I want to go back to epistemology, which is the area that I've worked in the most. There is a digital epistemology, uh, and it goes back to Leibniz, actually. Leibniz is the first information theorist, I would say. He was very proud to discover binary arithmetic. Maybe other people have discovered it. He thought the Chinese had it in the I, I Ching. But um, uh, he also built one of the first computing machines. Uh, La, the, the, the Pascal has, of course, the, I think the first one, La Pascaline. But um, um, Leibniz visited the Royal Society in London with a, with a machine that could uh, multiply. And I think on that basis, they made him a foreign member of the Royal Society. Of course, if they had known what, Newton, what was going to happen with Newton, they would have never have done this. But at that time, uh, Leibniz was not yet persona non grata in England. So, um, but the most interesting thing that Leibniz actually did is in 1686, the, the Discours de Metaphysique, Discourse on Metaphysics. 